This is the Guns Magazine podcast, episode number 79. Hi there, and welcome to the Guns Magazine podcast. I'm your host and the editor of Guns Magazine, Brent Wheat. Thanks for joining us as we talk to the interesting people who make up the world of shooting, hunting, and the firearms industry. First, before we get started, I'd like to welcome two new sponsors to the Guns Magazine podcast. First is our presenting sponsor, Boyd's Gun Stocks. Boyd's Gun Stocks is the largest aftermarket gun stock maker in the world. Boyd's Gun Stocks fit your body better. They offer gun stocks for over 155 gun brands in over 1,200 different models. Try out their 22 stock shapes in 20 different colors and experience the better fit and incredible beauty they offer. Celebrating 40 years in the business this year in 2021, shoot better with Boyd's. For more information, visit boydsgunstocks.com. We'd also like to welcome our supporting sponsor, the fine folks at Hodgden Powder. Established in 1947, the Hodgden Powder Company has grown into the U.S. largest supplier of smokeless, black powder, and black powder substitute propellants. These great powders are distributed under the Hodgden, IMR, Winchester, Ramshot, Accurate, Pyrodex, 777, Blackhorn 209, and GoX brands. For more information about all these great products, visit Hodgden.com. Nowadays, more shooters have a passing familiarity with emergency treatment of gunshot wounds, and many of us now carry a blowout kit, including tourniquets and chest seals. However, I just had a recent experience that made things less academic and far more personal. Because of my recent incident, I decided to talk with Larkin Ware, an ER doctor who has plenty of experience treating gunshot wounds. During our talk, we started with pre-hospital tourniquets and went all the way to what a surgeon does. I hope you'll never need any of this information, but if you spend time around firearms, I hope you can file all this away just in case. Here's emergency room doc Larkin Ware talking about gunshot wounds. Well, good morning, Larkin. Good morning. How are you? I'm glorious on this day. How are you down in Mississippi? Oh, I can't complain. It's a little cloudy here, but, you know, weather's still nice. Yeah. Well... The reason we are talking today, we have never met before. We just met a few minutes ago when I dialed the phone. Um, But our own Dr. Will Dabbs, I was talking to him about gunshot wounds, and I'll explain why in just a moment. But I I asked Doc if he would uh, come on the podcast and talk about it, and he suggested you, Larkin. He said you've got a little more uh, getting your hands dirty kind of experience on the subject, and you're a, a doc and an ER doc, and he thought you would be a good one to talk. And if, if that's uh, Dr. Dab's opinion, then that's good enough for me. So appreciate you being on the Guns Magazine podcast. Well, I appreciate y'all inviting me. Yeah, I've known Dr. Dabbs for a few years now, and, you know, he's been a doctor a few years longer than I have. I, I don't know if I'm more experienced than he is, but, you know, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> So you're an ER doc, and you have quite a bit of experience with gunshot wounds. And as I said, there's a reason for bringing this up, and I have to be a little vague at this point for various reasons folks probably understand. I had an incident at the shooting range. I ended up in the hospital, and... As I've told several people, when your name and a trauma surgeon are mentioned in the same sentence, that's not a good day at the range. So <clears throat> I've had uh, some some differing experiences. You know, I've, I've attended many tactical medic classes. I was a cop for many, many years, and I've done all that uh, pre-planning in my head. If a friend gets shot, if I get shot, you know, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. But I will say tac med classes tend to stop as soon as EMS shows up. You know, once the professionals get there, then that's where things kind of end. And, and I understand that from the victim standpoint or the, the first right. responder standpoint, but I'm kind of talking now from the victim standpoint that there's a, there's a lot more that goes on, and that's where uh, I thought it would be interesting to kind of focus more on that end of it, uh, since I've got some recent experience in that way. So we're, we're going to talk about uh, pre-hospital care, of course, but uh, then we're going to get into the whole ER thing. Yeah, so um, I will tell a little bit about myself if you want me to. Um, like you said, I am an ER doctor. I've been in the ER. I've been out of residency for about eight years now. Did three years of residency in emergency medicine. 
before I went to medical school, I was an EMT and rode in an ambulance and took care of a lot of pre-hospital issues like you're describing as well. So unfortunately and fortunately, things have changed quite a bit since I was an EMT, but, uh, you know, things have gotten a lot better in that time period too. So, yeah. Well, the survival rates have gone up significantly, which people point to the murder rates going down. Well, uh, what they don't understand is because people are getting better care and they're making it to the hospital. Exactly. That golden hour of trauma is what we call it. You know, if you can get somebody to the hospital slash surgeon slash OR, whatever they need within that first hour of uh, injury, their survival rate goes up exponentially. Yep. So this may sound pretty uh, obvious. What kills people for gunshots? I mean, what what about gunshots is it that kills people? Uh, so location, you know, they all, you know, real estate is location, 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 and so is gunshot wounds. I mean, if you know, if you if you took a, and unfortunately, I had a case like this recently. If you took a forty five to the head, that's going to be <laughs> a definite no go. And then, but if you you know, took a look uh, it also to the chest. Bleeding kills people quickly as well. You know, if you uh, took a gunshot wound to an artery, especially one of the big arteries, I've seen people get shot in the leg and it clipped their femoral artery and those people bleed out very quickly. It, you know, that's the big thing that kills people in the first few, uh, in the first hours, bleeding, you know, and then uh, depending on what they got shot with and what all the bullet hit, can uh, you know kill them within the first twenty four hours? So, so bleeding is the big thing, obviously. And we were talking a minute ago before we got started that uh, you're a, you're a fan of the Stop the Bleed program. Yeah, that's uh, I believe it's put out by the American College of Surgeons. A lot of trauma surgeons got together and uh, wanted to try to figure out how to teach people with no medical background on if you were involved in a shooting or if you're buddy next to you accidentally shot himself what you can do to kind of help uh help them get the care that they need and what you can do before that uh like you said that ems care arrives to uh help them and uh if you know if you're interested in that by all means look at the website for the american college of surgeons you can actually google stop the bleed class and it pops up Yep. And, you know, we're talking about gunshot wounds today, but kitchen knives, chainsaws, glass, oh, yeah. yeah, that kills a lot of people every year. Yeah. And it, it and like I said, a lot of times it's uh, the bleeding, you know, that's what's going to kill people quicker is uh, how much blood they lost. And, you know, one of the things is like I've seen people come in telling me that they've lost a lot of blood and, you know, the amount of bleeding that people tend to think they lose is actually not the amount that they actually lost. Yeah. Um, you know, panic sets in when you have suddenly shot yourself and you may sit there and think that you're bleeding out when, uh, and then when you get to the ER, I cover you up with a band aid and send you home, you yeah. know, it's, it's just the nature of the beast. But, um, when an EMT shows up and tells me that there was blood everywhere, I start getting a lot more worried. <laughs> exactly. I actually had an instructor one time when we were talking about when do you apply a tourniquet? And he said his rule was as a professional, if you show up and go, oh, my God, yeah, you probably <laughs> need to get the tourniquet out. Right. So uh, in terms of tourniquets, when I was an EMT in our class, the way that they said was direct pressure first. You put your hand on it, and if you can get it to stop bleeding with that, you probably don't need a tourniquet. Yep. Okay. The next thing is you put a, you put a try to apply a pressure dressing. Okay. So that means if you've got galls and stuff around, which uh, that goes down to if you have a basic first aid kit, a lot of those will come in with galls. You just wrap it up as tight as you can with some galls over it. And if that doesn't stop the bleeding, then you apply the tourniquet. Now, the thing is, a lot of people, a lot of things that they're bleeding heavily enough that they are soaking through your uh, pressure dressing as you're applying it. You probably don't need the pressure dressing. You probably need to just go ahead and apply the tourniquet. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and that's a point that I wanted to discuss and get your viewpoint is in all the classes and then just informal discussions I've had with EMT buddies. And I've known a lot of uh, military medics that have a lot of gunshot wound practical experience. I've never heard two of them agree on on a good tourniquet. It's so funny. That is one yeah. thing that they they all have their their personal favorite and the rest of them generally are junk. What What's your thought? So. 
You're you're 100 percent right. And my if you ask two different doctors, our uh, opinions are going to be the complete opposite of each other. I'm sure uh, we use the uh, it's called the cat tourniquet. It's a combat application tourniquet. Yep. So the biggest thing with tourniquets is practice. If you own a tourniquet, you got to know how to use your tourniquet. Otherwise, it's just a piece of cloth sitting on the side of the uh, in your bag that you have no idea what to do with it. Yep. Um, but if you you know, ours, I like ours a lot because you just slide it over the extremity and you basically just twist it down until the bleeding stops and then it will clip on and uh, there's a clip there that holds it in place. Yep. And uh, so that's the tourniquet that we use in the ER and uh, that our police department and uh, most of our medics use around here um, just because it's, uh, easy application, and I uh, think they used it in the military. I mean, it's a combat application tourniquet. Yep. They used it in the military a lot, too. So It's got hundreds of saves uh, in America and on America's battlefields. Is there any tourniquet you would say absolutely stay away from? And I'm thinking of one brand that basically it's a big rubber band, and I actually carried one not because I thought it was super effective, but it was so small I could carry it in my uh, my bat belt when I was on duty, and I figured that would buy me enough time for somebody with a, a good, really good tourniquet uh, could could get on the scene. I, that was more of a self-first aid kind of thing, but do you think those are worth the trouble? Was I... Uh, whistling past the graveyard or do they have some some use so again it's all dependent on what you're comfortable with and what you have available i mean if that's the only thing you've got available and you know how to use it then by all means use it until somebody gets there i mean there are some um ambulance services i'm sure that are still out there that their tourniquets are blood pressure cuffs yeah Okay, and those uh, ambulance services that have blood pressure cuffs they use what they have and they do it with uh, amazing finesse until they can get them to a hospital that has something a little bit more advanced. Yeah. So in terms of, is there a wrong one? I would have to say no. Okay. Um, are there some that are better than others? Oh yes, definitely. But if there's a wrong one, I, I would have to say no. If it, if it keeps the person alive long enough to get uh, them some help, then by all means use it. Well, I had one instructor say, something is better than nothing. You can always argue that last 96% or whatever, but something is better than nothing. So, and Exactly. Another thing that uh, I find very controversial, and, and doctors often weigh on this on both sides of it, is tampons. Um, I know a lot of guys, and I've carried back in, in quote-unquote, the day when this first became a thing, I carried those, and now they've got a lot of actual dressings made for right. uh, you know gunshot wounds and, and the, the coagulating dressings and all that. But um, I've, I've had people tell me, oh, never put a tampon on a wound. It'll just contaminate and be horrible. And, you know, uh, your thoughts from an actual educated standpoint? Well, again, if it's going to save a life, it's going to save a life. One of the attendings that uh, I had in residency, uh, this guy got shot in the chest and he cracked the chest open before the uh, surgeon got there to try to save the guy's life. And the surge, and I mean, the guy ended up dying, but the surgeon was, uh, he looked at the surgeon and said, was there anything you would have done differently? And he said, yeah, I would have squirted some beta down on the chest before you cracked. And he said, well, I'll give him some antibiotics. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, the thing is, if, if a tampon is all you've got available, then use it. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I, when I saw your uh, email that you were talking about it, I was like, I, I actually not heard of using a tampon before. And then I thought about it and I was like, that's kind of an ingenious idea because that's a common household product. These wounds typically are pretty dirty anyways. I mean, something went through somebody. Yeah. You know, there's, I'm sure that whoever loaded the gun didn't wash their hand before they uh, <laughs> loaded it. So the person, I mean, if it's bad enough that it's needing a tampon, the patient's probably going to go to the OR and get all that washed out anyways. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> good point. Now, I thought that was nationwide because I've heard medics all over the place argue about it and actually had a, a doc friend. I actually have had two doc friends that one's, oh, never, ever do that. And one's like, kind of like what you said, which is if it saves a life, who cares? You know? Right. You'll deal with the infection later. Yeah, so like I was telling you, you know, I was talking to her uh, trauma uh, 
people uh, are trauma nurses that are affiliated with that about this because they're really heavy into that stop the bleed cor- course, mm-hmm. and they actually teach uh, this tampon use in that uh, in their course here. Now I don't know if that's uh-huh. nationwide in their courses, but uh, they you know. <laughs> They said that they uh, pull out tampons in the class and show the guys how to use them. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah, I don't think I would know how to use one. I, I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the whole pre-hospital care thing is something we could – that's an entire show, and I'll probably do that at some point. But the, re, the main thrust, as I said, is I wanted to talk to you about the stuff that happens after the professionals get on the scene and the patient is stable and being transported. Um, in my case, I took myself to the ER, which I've, I've heard alternately that was, that was kind of macho or exceptionally stupid. Um, I just didn't want to create a big circus uh, at the scene right. at, the, at the range, and I felt like I was – in good enough shape, I could do that without endangering myself or the public. But let, let's start there. Okay, you've suffered uh, a, a gunshot wound. The medics are on the scene, and now the fire department and my my friends, the police, and there's going to be reports and all that. But the the patient gets to you. You're working in the ER. Talk a little bit about some of the things that happen because it it ain't like TV. Uh, I've certainly seen that right. in my practice, and it ain't like TV. And having now seen it from the part of being laying there on the gurney uh there's a lot of things that even i didn't think about right so yeah this is not Grey's anatomy you're gonna uh yeah we're gonna leave that part along right there but uh so you play the part of the handsome dashing doctor right 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 no that's far from that uh so all right well let's just start off as if it was a scenario okay that's in medicine, a lot of times that's their, our easiest way to teach people is we give you a scenario. This is what happened on scene. This is what happens next. So mm-hmm. you, uh, let's say you got shot. Like you said, the ambulance was called. All, when the ambulance gets there, they're going to assess the, your stability and assess the severity of your wound, okay? So in terms of assessing you, they're, they're going to check your vital signs. They're going to start IVs on you, and the general rule up of the of EMS and uh, medicine is if I can't see the wound, I can't assess it. So you show up in the ER and you still got clothes on, in my opinion, that medic didn't do their job. Yeah. Okay? So um, when I was an EMT, the general rule is strip them and flip them. Yep. Okay? If you can't see it, you can't assess it. So like you said, gunshot wounds when they go in they don't typically come out in a straight line okay so if there's only one hole you need to be looking for a second one okay and if you can't find a second one assume that the bullet's still inside but that's not always the case either sometimes i'll I'll give you an interesting story about that in a minute but yeah so if the if a medic shows up on scene and they are assessing you do not be surprised when the scissors come out and your pants go off yep okay (laughs) It's just the nature of the beast. If we, if you got shot in the leg, I mean, I've had situations where a guy was sitting on the couch, his buddy was cleaning a gun across the room, and he got uh, shot in the foot. Well, the bullet went through his foot, into his leg, and up into his stomach. I mean, you oh, know, my. that kind of thing happens, you know. And the medic wouldn't have known because the guy's sitting there seeing all the blood coming out of his foot. That's what he's freaking out about. And he didn't even realize that the bullet had gone into, uh, had come out the top of his foot and gone into his thigh. Yeah. You know, so. Well, I'll interject here that I had a case where I was trying to roust a drunk and laying in the alley until somebody lifted his shirt and pointed out he'd been stabbed in the chest. And he, he didn't bleed a bit. He ended up dying from this wound and it didn't bleed a bit until they cracked his chest and then it looked like somebody had spilled a bucket of blood in the the uh, trauma room so you know we always assume the we've got in our head that a gunshot wound is you know the pink mist and the splatter and all that and there are times it may not bleed hardly at all but it's still a maybe even a fatal wound oh yeah i've had uh people get shot in the leg it come out the leg and go behind the scrotum oh. okay i mean it's just Gunshots are highly, un- well, they're not highly unpredictable, but they can be unpredictable on where they go in and where they come out. And if, if general rule, if you can't see it, you don't know where it is. Mm-hmm. So you need to, but do not be surprised if the paramedic cuts off all your clothes, underwear included, shirts, everything comes off, and they look you over head to toe. 
Yep. And that's it should be. And then um, they're going to be now, depending on now, if all they see is the gunshot wound to your foot. Great. They're going to call me and say, I've got a gunshot wound to the foot. I'm getting an IV started. I'm probably going to give them some pain medicine on the way. I know what to expect when that person gets there. Okay. Now, if they tell me I see a entrance wound into the thigh, I don't see an exit wound. Okay. Then I have to judge, well, is this a distal thigh wound? Is this a proximal thigh wound? You know, when, um, so most states have a trauma criteria. They have a trauma system set up for gunshot wounds, wrecks, things like that. So patients that are, you know, involved in these incidences can get into a hospital and the appropriate to the appropriate facility in the quickest amount of time. Okay. So if you got shot in the thigh at our facility, that is considered an activated trauma. In other words, that's going to get my CT tech, my x-ray tech lab, and maybe even the surgeon involved very quickly so that we can get you assessed, find out where, where that bullet is, what that bullet hit, and figure out where you need to go next. So anyways, the medic got, got on scene. They started your IV. They've uh, seen where you've been shot. They're going to call me report. They're going to give me vital signs off of you. Now, the, the biggest thing with the vital signs is if they were able to obtain them. I've had incident <laughs> situations. <laughs> that was a difficult word, like Worcestershire. Worcestershire. <laughs> Okay. Um, I've had situations where the patient was in such critical condition that the medic was doing all they could just to keep the patient alive until they could get them to the hospital that they didn't even have time to get bottle signs on them. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, that instance, you know, that in and of itself tells me enough right there. You know, if the medic says the patient is too sick for me to get bottle signs on my surgeon is probably going to meet you at the door, mm -hmm. hopefully. Okay. Um, again, that is all relative to the, to the hospital that you show up at. If you're in the middle of Podunk, Mississippi, and there is your nearest hospital is a Band-Aid station, quote unquote, that happens a lot, you know, there might not be a surgeon on call. You're going to, so the medic calls, tells me I've got a real, really critical gunshot wound they bring them in. My job is to start assessing you and find out what your injuries are. Okay. If I am in, like I said, Podunk, Mississippi, where I'm a Band-Aid station, I don't have a surgeon. This might include uh, very little on my, my part. I might be doing just x-rays and then transferring you to a higher level of care as quickly as I possibly can um, and stabilizing you as best as I can in that time that you're with me. So I'm going to assess your vital signs. If your blood pressure is low, I'm going to start uh, blood on you. While I'm uh, listening to you, see if you've got something called a pneumothorax or a collapsed lung. Uh, that's something that in the immediate phase I can take care of. I will, at that point, I would probably uh, end up putting a, something called a chest tube in to drain the collapsed lung, drain any blood that's in there. And that actually helps stabilize a lot of people. Um, you know, the biggest thing is, the same stuff that they do pre-hospital, a lot of stuff is what I'm going to do in the hospital. I'm going to assess your airway, breathing, circulation in the first uh, few minutes of you being there. Most of the time, that's really easy for ER physicians to do. We've done it enough times that we know what to look for. If you're walking in screaming at me, bloody murder, saying, I've been shot, I've been shot, <laughs> your airway's open, you're breathing. Yeah. I mean, I'm, <laughs> you know, now that doesn't tell me how you're breathing, but I mean, it tells me that your airway's open and you're breathing. So, um, you know, I don't really have to do much from that in, in terms of those. But um, then, like I said, if the patient comes in, they're not breathing with a gunshot wound to the chest. The first thing I'm going to do is stabilize their airway. I'm going to get I'm going to put them on a ventilator, get a tube in their throat to help them breathe. You know, this is, again, this is all worst case scenario type stuff. Yeah. And I figured it'd probably be easier to start off with the worst case scenario so people you know, aren't surprised if it happens to them. I think that's the big takeaway and something I learned uh, common sense, as it seems the medical community takes gunshot wounds real serious from the get go. Oh, yeah. 
until proven otherwise, which is a great thing if you're a patient. But sometimes you, in like my case where I'm walking wounded, you know, I, I was trying to minimize it, I guess, psychologically myself and not to get a big hullabaloo started. But the, the, the folks, you know, the medical folks take it really, really seriously because, like you said, you just don't know until you can rule stuff out. Exactly. So I've had uh, I had a <laughs> it was probably my first night shift out of residency. Oh, boy. Actually. Yeah. Right. I just kind of set the president for uh, future endeavors. <laughs> um, had a, a shooting actually in the town that I live in and uh, two friends were running across the field. One of them got shot um, in the leg, shattered his femur. His friend bends over to pick him up, and he gets shot in the back. Mm. Okay, so traje- tra- I learned, and it's really sad that I learned this, but on on the fly. But trajectory is a trajectory, <laughs> uh, Worcestershire. Yeah. Um, it's a big thing with gunshot wounds. Okay, because this bullet went in below his shoulder blade. Okay, and uh, after the surgeon got there. I w- we had assessed him. I couldn't find an exit wound, did a chest X-ray, sh- saw that he had a big hemothorax, which is blood in his chest on the right side. I had already started putting the chest tube in by the time the surgeon got there, was giving the guy blood, fluids, giving him pain medicine, uh, was actually stabilizing him. And then I sat there and thought as we were about to transfer the guy out, we never saw the bullet. Huh. You know, we, the bullet wasn't in his chest. Okay. So I immediately sent the x-ray text back in there, and this was all within, like, the first 30 minutes of him being there. So it wasn't like we lost a lot of time, but uh, x-rayed his belly, no bullet there. So I was like, where in the world did it go? So then I thought about what happened and what he said, that he bent over to pick up his buddy, and the way that the bullet went, it went under his shoulder blade, through his chest, and lodged in the side of his neck. So, you know, we're going to do x-rays to see – I, I mean, after you, uh, so like if you were at that little hospital, they're going to do the bare minimum to keep you alive, to get you to the bigger hospital. And then that bigger hospital is going to figure out where all your injuries are and what needs to be done next. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I work at a level three trauma center for our trauma criteria. That means that we tend to stabilize and ship. For the most part, we're going to stabilize you and ship you to the level one trauma center, which is the big, the big guns. They got all the trauma residents and trauma fellows and trauma surgeons. And they're standing at the ready waiting uh, for this to happen. I mean, you're not a surgeon and you don't claim oh, to be not. one, but talk a little bit about what surgeons do. Cause that's what everybody thinks of. Oh, if you get shot, you got to go into surgery. And as I learned in, in my incident that uh, a lot of times they leave metal in your body and that kind of surprised oh, yeah. me. Yeah. So, um, all right. So let's say you got shot in the stomach. Okay. Um, or shot in the chest. And I have made sure that, You're not going to die in the next 30 minutes, that your vital signs are all stable. You know, by the time that uh, that 30 minutes has happened, the surgeon at our facility, the surgeon might not have arrived yet. Okay. Our surgeons actually take home call. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you get there, you actually are in the care of an ER doctor that, um, you know, and I mean, we're trained to take care of this until the next person arrives. You know what I mean? So. You know, if you are stable, I am going to send you to a CT scanner and figure out what injuries you are. So that way, when the surgeon gets there, he can make a decision on what needs to be done next. Okay. Now, if you're not stable, I'm not going to send you to the CT scanner because people like to die in CT scanners with <laughs> gunshot wounds. Yeah. And, um, and I'm going to keep you in the ER and keep you uh, as stable as I can until that surgeon arrives. If he makes the decision that you need to go to the OR, so what he's going to do is he's going to make, again, like I said earlier with uh, us in the ER, if I can't see the wound, how do I know what to do with it? If, he, if the surgeon has decided not to do a CT scan because you're too uh, sick and he takes you to the OR, if he can't see where you're injured, he can't do anything about it. So you're going to not end up with a big, nice uh, scar on the uh, front part of your stomach. And you will never be able to wear a bikini again. Ah, <laughs> there went my modeling career. Right, right. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, 
I'd say that a lot of times the surgeons nowadays, they do amazing work when they're, uh, but their jobs at that point is to keep you alive. They don't, it, it is not, to, uh, you know, save your modeling career. Right. You know, so they're going to make a big old incision. They're going to open you up and they're going to, they don't care where the bullet is. They only care what the bullet hit on the way to where it stopped. Okay. Mm-hmm. So um, they're going to open you up. They're going to look and see what all's, I mean, the last one that I had, the bullet went um, through the guy's small intestines um, in a couple of different places and then went uh, uh, out through his stomach. It lodged right at his diaphragm, that big muscle that helps you breathe at the bottom of your chest, before it went through it. So uh, the guy, in terms of that, was lucky because if it had gone through his diaphragm, that would have been a lot of issues. But, um, like, he ended up losing part of his small intestines, part of his stomach, and... um, but uh, like I said, the surgeon, when he gets there and he opens you up, he's going to look and see what all that bullet hit. And they're going to uh, they're going to open you up and they're going to look for bleeding. If they, you know, like I said, people die from bleeding quicker than most anything else. That big hole that you've got in your stomach, uh, the actual organ stomach is not going to kill you as quick as you bleeding from your spleen when, uh, you know, when you're in the operating room. So. The surgeon's going to get in there and try to stop the bleeding, and then he's going to uh, fix any damage that needs to be fixed in the uh, immediate time frame. And then, um, and then if he can close you up, he can. Some of them are so bad that they can't close up, and they have to take them back to the OR at a future, like in the next either the next 24 hours or a couple of days to go in there and see what's going on again. Mm-hmm. Well, talk a little bit about extremity wounds because that's pretty common on the shooting range right. especially uh people holstering their gun they shoot themselves in the the thigh and they're generally subcutaneous so they they don't hit the right. bone or anything they just kind of skim along or the people shoot themselves in the hand they shoot themselves in the foot um not necessarily life-threatening but uh it's still pretty significant right so um again you know even with extremities, there are big arteries that run through there. But I mean, if you hit one of those arteries with a bullet, you're, you're going to know it pretty quick. Um, but like if you shot yourself in the hand, when you show up in the ER, depending on, you know, if it goes through and through, most of the time in the ER, we do an x-ray of it and see if it got any bones. If you were one of the lucky ones and it missed all of the bones, you probably get a bandage, some neosporin, antibiotics, and get discharged home, you yeah. know. Yep. And uh, a lot of that can happen within an hour, you know. Um, if you, uh, but I mean, if you shattered some bones in there, then we're talking about needing an orthopedic surgeon, um, and they have to take a look at it. Uh, a lot of times we end up cleaning them out in the ER, and depending on the orthopedic surgeon sometimes, or depending on the break, actually, in the orthopedic surgeon, sometimes it's a you know, clean them up, bandage them up, splint them, and they see them in clinic the next day versus they come in and uh, take them on to the operating room that day later that afternoon and do a full-on washout of that break and everything and uh, repair what they can. Just because uh, you got a gunshot wound doesn't mean that you have to go to the OR. A lot of times it doesn't even mean that you have to see a surgeon, you know, um, if you shot yourself in the forearm, or I've actually had a guy shot, shoot himself in the calf, went in the back part of his calf and came out the other side, I, uh, he got there, I looked at it, it was just a straight-on shot. I probably could have actually stuck a Q-tip straight through the uh, hole that he went through. I, I didn't. But I, <laughs> Ouch. I, and, uh, you know, x-rayed it. It looked good. Made sure that uh, he didn't have any signs of... Uh, any subtle signs of an arterial injury or nerve injury or anything like that. I bandaged him up, gave him some pain medicine, gave him some antibiotics and told him he needs to follow up with a doctor in a couple of days Yep. for a wound check. You know, that's the, that's the secondary part is like just keeping an eye on these wounds and make sure they're not getting infected. You know, even though we put you on antibiotics, that doesn't guarantee that they won't get infected. Yeah. And, and talk a little bit about some of that with, you know, you don't have to get into all the permutations and possibilities, but that's what kind of surprised me. They gave me antibiotics and said, you're fine. Go on home. Just watch for infection. Right. And there's a lot of uh, instances where I've had, had issues. I have had patients like that that shot themselves in the leg. I've had people come in with graze wounds, you know, in the leg where it, you, there's this, this little abrasion down the side of the leg and they don't even really need antibiotics for them. 
and they're and I'm telling them, all right, well, you know, you're gonna be good to go home, and they just look at me and say, but I shot myself, and I'm like, <laughs> did you do it on purpose? <laughs> <laughs> If you didn't do it on purpose, then you're good to go home. Here's your band aid and your neosporin, and uh, you know we wish you the best of luck. Yeah. Um, and I say that in jest, you know, in the ER, our job is to, you know, make sure whatever you have isn't going to kill you. And if an ER doctor is telling you you're good to go, then 99% of the time, what you have isn't going to kill you. Yep. Okay. So if you if you shot yourself in the calf and it came out the other side, and I've x-rayed you and watched you in the ER and you're doing fine. And, you know, I send you home 99% of the time, you're going to be fine. Yeah. You know? and, and talk a little bit about that. Cause I've certainly seen it as a cop. You've seen it as an EMT and certainly as a, as a doctor in the ER. <laughs> talk about being a good victim. Um, Cause I've seen everything from people that are like seriously on death's doorstep that are just calm and collected. And I've seen people with the proverbial scratch that are losing their freaking minds. And I know you have. Oh yeah. So uh, since you've mentioned that, I will give you an interesting scenario. Uh, I had, I was working one night and I had this, these two, actually it was about four gentlemen break through our ambulance door. Like they literally broke the door down. Oh my. One guy could have easily been a linebacker for the 49ers um, back in their day when they were really good. Um, (laughs) Sorry. I hope there's 49ers fans. (laughs) Well, we'll get Um, letters. Oh, well, uh, just forward them on. I'll, I'll give you my address later. Okay. But uh, anyways, He's screaming at the top of his lungs. He's been shot. He's been shot. And this man is easily four times my size. Hmm. At first, I thought, because he was the one screaming, that he was the one that had been shot. Yeah. Then when I realized that it was not him that had been shot, I thought it was some guy that was dead in the car that had been shot. Yeah. I did not realize that it was the guy that was half my size walking in behind him that was as quiet as quiet could be. Um not saying anything that had been shot. Yeah. Okay. So the biggest issue is staying calm. I mean, you know, I, if you're screaming at me to do something and I'm standing at the bedside, then uh, I am doing something. I am trying to figure out what injuries he has, but I can't do something. If you are screaming at me to do something, you understand what I mean? <laughs> like yep. this, this guy was actually pushing cops around and all kinds of other issues. Anyways, I'm not going to go into it, but anyways, the, uh, the guy that got shot ended up being fine. It was a, well, it was a through and through into his neck actually. Oh. And, uh, yeah. So ended up having to send him to a, a big trauma center because of the nature of the wound, but he was actually, uh, they assessed him, ran some more tests on him. Everything looked fine and they discharged him within 48 hours. So, again, it took me a lot longer to assess him and get him taken care of because of the family member that was freaking out. So, you know, the biggest thing is, like you said, staying calm, helping us figure out where you're injured. You know, if you if you are hurting somewhere or something doesn't feel right, then by all means, tell us. Okay, don't just sit there on the stretcher and be quiet and say I'm fine. Okay, (laughs) you know if. we take gunshot wounds, like you said, very seriously because people die from gunshot wounds and we need to, this is the way that we can make sure that you're not going to die from the gunshot wound. So if, you know, that guy that, um, you know, I was telling you earlier that got shot in the back of the chest and the bullet ended up in his neck. Well, um, after I, after we found the bullet, he was sitting there saying, yeah, I meant to tell you my arm's weak. Oh, so if he had told me that, I yeah. would have known, hey, the bullet might be in his neck, in his head, anything like that. We might need to do some more <laughs> investigating, you know. But um, anyway, so if something doesn't feel right after you've been shot, you need to tell us. Like if you said, like like I was saying earlier, you got shot in the thigh. If you're, if for some reason you feel nauseated, please tell me, yep. you know, <laughs> yep. because I, I need to know this stuff so that I can go looking for further injuries. Yeah. You know? And all this we say with a grain of salt because everybody's different. Sure. People react to things differently. You know, like you said, I've had, you know, farmers, 
shoot themselves in the, uh, I mean, blow fingers off, blow toes off, you know, with their shotgun and <laughs> they show up in the ER bleeding all over the place. And he's just sitting there looking at you like I shot myself in the foot yeah. and you're like, well, did you bring your toes with you? I mean, <laughs> yeah. And he's like, no, there was too many pieces. I didn't know where oh, they all were. Oh okay. Goodness. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well. Well, you know, something that uh, you kind of hit on, and uh, again, I've got to be intentionally vague because we're not sure how this is going on, but I did not shoot myself in the hand or the foot, nor did anybody else. I caught a piece of shrapnel in the belly, and as it turned out, um, if I had been a a man of lesser size, uh, it had gotten probably pretty serious (laughs) or in a different location, but as it turns out, I've just got a piece of brass in me, and uh, but it's a pretty good sized chunk. Well, anyway, uh, during the initial moment, and I'll talk about my psychology here, um, when this incident happened, I knew something had happened and I checked myself for injuries and my hand came back from underneath my shirt covered in blood. And there was the moment where I thought, I really thought for a few seconds, oh my Lord, I, I just got center punched with this large caliber round and I'm going to die right here. And it just made me mad. I don't know why I didn't regret anything or, but I was just, I was mad that this had happened. But then, uh, so I'm kind of standing there thinking, okay, do I collapse now? What am I supposed to do? I, I never had victim training. And uh, I, I, some words that an instructor who I sadly have forgotten who it was, but they told me years ago and it suddenly popped in my head. If you're worried about how bad you're hurt, you're not hurt that bad. And believe it or not, that brought me great comfort because I thought this could be serious, but I, I'm probably not going to die right here right now. And that just that helped me calm down. Make I safe the gun, uh, made my decision, uh, assessed myself, made the decision and decided to drive in so that I didn't want people da- endangered by uh fire trucks and police cars and ambulances were running hot and all that. I just thought, let's keep this thing on a low key basis and I'll just drive myself to the hospital. Yeah. So that, uh, uh yeah, uh, the whole driving yourself to the hospital thing. I mean, that's, that's still impressive. I, I have to say, when you told me the story, I was like, that, that's just impressive. I mean, but your instructor's right. If you have time enough to think, Oh my gosh, I'm shot. Oh my gosh. Am I going to die? You know, you're probably not, in one of those, I mean, you could be, but you're sure. probably not in one of those immediate phases that, you know, you're going to drop dead in the next five seconds. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if you have time enough to think that, then you probably have time enough to, like you said, check yourself, figure out where you got hurt. And the biggest thing during that is, again, staying calm enough that you can figure out what you need to do next for yourself. Or if your buddy next to you got shot, staying calm enough that you can figure out what to do for him. Yep. Um, you know, there's a, uh, in, in our med, when I was in med school, we read this book called the house of God. Um, and there's these rules of the house of God. It, it was a story about a resident that, uh, or an intern that, uh, it was, you know, anyways, the rules of the house guy, one of them was um, if you walk into a critical situation or a code, the first thing you do is you check your own pulse. OK, ah. and that helps kind of center you, helps you try to figure out, you know, what you can do to calm yourself down to take care of the person that's next to you. Yep. And it, it works for this as well. I mean, if your buddy got shot, you got to stay calm to help him help himself. And if you're freaking out, then it's not going to do him any, any good. Um, that's going to make him more worried and make him freak out more, which could cause him more issues. Yep. So. And that's something we always had to practice as police officers because we show up in the middle of stuff that's ongoing and it's it's sometimes hard to keep yourself under control. But I, I have to say, I've always kind of been in awe, uh, you know, over my career. I've I've uh, actually had to write in with a few patients to level one trauma and, and witnessed a chest crack and all this stuff. So literally, there's a guy cutting another guy's chest open and massaging his uh-huh. heart with his hand. And I'm thinking <laughs> and everybody's like cool and calm with it, which you don't want him screaming like there's a few TV shows normally they portray it pretty accurately but there's some where they they get very dramatic and they sweat and you know all that but for the most part everybody is very icy cold uh to keep themselves under control and and again if you're laying there on a gurney that's what you want so it a abc always be cool exactly and so the thing is like if your er doctor comes in and he's not freaked out and he is 
you know, talking to you in a normal tone. Do not think for a second that he is not caring, that he is not worried about you. You, it, my general rule is, and forgive me, any surgeons that are listening to this, but if I'm in one of those situations, I want the surgeon that's the asshole because he's going to save my <laughs> Yep. Yep. And there's no way to put that, you know, yeah. if they're going to do good work, they're going to keep you alive and they're going to be, uh, because they're going to be calm, collected the whole time. And if he comes off as a jerk and he comes off as, you know, that he is not worried about you, I want him, he can take me to the OR right now. Yep. Okay. You know, that's the, and the, it's the same way for the uh, CR doctors. If, if you shot yourself and we come in and we're, I don't want to say nonchalant about it, but we are calm, collected, and we're just, you know, looking at things and we're not freaked out about it. And we're, there's a reason for that. And it, we're trained to be that way. I mean, we learn to deal with ourselves later on, you know, after, sure. after the case is over or after a shift is over or however that may be. And I mean, there's, it's nothing for some of us to, you know, go out of one patient's room that's having a heart attack into another patient's room that's having a stroke. And then, Oh, a gunshot wound to the belly is showing up and we have to bounce around and we have to stay that way the whole time. Yep. And it's just the nature of uh, what we, what we do. And, you know, if I was to freak out in any of one of those cases, it could cost somebody their life. Exactly. Yeah. You know, because then I can't, deal with the next one that's coming in. I mean, it's like, like you said, this could be, like you said, the pre-hospital stuff could be a two hour lecture in and of itself. The ER stuff could be an hour lecture of itself. And then what happens in the OR? And then, I mean, people train in residencies for this. Like my residency was three years. Most general surgery residencies are five. And then if they go on to do trauma fellowships and stuff like that, they have extra uh, years of residency after that. I mean, you're talking about years of training to take care of these patients in, in every situation that they could present with. Yep. All I can say is if you ever walk into a level one trauma center and the trauma surgeon goes, I have never seen that before. <laughs> that. <laughs> That's when you can start getting nervous. And actually, even then I wouldn't be nervous yeah. because, you know, even though they might have never seen that particular thing before, it's one of those things where we've seen some flavor of it before. Right. You know? <laughs> right. Well, Larkin, it's been fantastic. I've I've really enjoyed this. And uh, again, I've got so many questions. We're going to we're going to have to do this again sometime. So but I do appreciate you taking time out from your extremely busy schedules in ER doc and and talking about something that's uh, got personal meaning to me right now. Hey, that's no problem. That's no problem at all. I enjoyed it any time. Today's talk wasn't a fun topic, but as I can attest, it's an important one. And with that, we hope you're enjoying the Guns Magazine podcast. Please tell all your friends, even the humor-impaired liberals. Guns Magazine was first in the business, and we're using our decades of friendships to bring in the most interesting chats in the gun world. If you've got questions or comments about the show, please email me. That's editor at gunsmagazine.com. Make sure you don't miss out on anything by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast catcher, YouTube, and of course, at gunsmagazine.com. And while you're online, don't forget to check out our great sister publication, American Handgunner Magazine, at americanhandgunner.com. We'd also appreciate it if you'd share a favorite episode or some kind words on your own social media. And don't forget to check out the presenting sponsor of the Guns Magazine podcast, Boyd's Gun Stocks. Learn more about their 1,200 different model gun stocks at boydsgunstocks.com. That's it for this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. For the entire staff at FMG Publications, I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat. Now get out there and get shooting. Get shooting.